Well, very good evening to everybody. It's Saturday evening and we're still in lockdown at level four, but come Monday, the 1st of June, things will change. We're going to level three and hopefully some uh, semblance of normality will resume. I'm sure lots of people sitting at home just can't, counting down the hours, champing at the bit to get back to their horses and throw a leg over and go for a ride. So we look forward to that. Once again, a big thank you to our sponsor of the series. It's uh, I4 Williams Trailers, Mumpro SA. Please go check out their Facebook page and their webpage. Big thank you to them. So uh, two gentlemen we're chatting to this evening, father and son, and I'm looking forward to this chat. Lots to talk about. It's the Morrisons, Peter and Matthew. And of course, Peter wears lots of hats. Uh, he's been a rider for many, many years. He's seen a lot, done a lot. We'll chat to him about his career. But then of course, also uh, Peter Morrison is the president of Gauteng South African Show Jumping. The family is planning to relocate to Ireland. Uh, there's lots and lots to chat about. So let's get right into it. And very good evening to the two of you. How are you? Hello, Aiden. Good, 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 good to see you. Oh, Are you sorry. well? Um, how's lockdown been going, first of all, up the road from us? Um, I've, to be honest, I've quite enjoyed lockdown. Um, it's been good. I've had lots of time with my horses. Um, yeah, doing lots of riding and spending lots of family time. Um, it's been, been great. Um, only problem is no one was paying us to be in lockdown, so that hasn't been yeah. so good. But, um, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the business as well, Peter, because uh, lots of changes there as well yeah. with Martin Collins and you moving away from Martin Collins, but the business will continue and you're moving to Ireland. So we'll chat up all about that. Matthew, um, how's it been going for you? You are, tell us, still at school or being homeschooled? So life pretty much carries on as normal for you, but without shows. Yeah, basically, it's been normal for me. Lockdown, I've, I'm homeschooled, so I do everything online. Um, so I've been riding the horses, training at home, and then just working. Yeah, so it's been been normal for me. Obviously, mm. But looking forward, obviously, to see if we can get yeah. back to some shows, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing we'll talk about because there have been proposals that have come across your desk, Peter, as to how we do proceed. But first yep. of all, as is the norm, let's get to know you a little bit. And uh, you've been in the game a long, long time. Take us, take us back to how it all started. Um, yeah, I started, I suppose, riding when I was about eight. Um, my parents weren't, weren't horsey at all. I had a, a grandfather, or my grandfather, rode in the army. So, and he he was in the the, the military, the sort of and and mounted unit in the army. Um, he died when I was probably four or five, so I didn't really get to know him. So, I can only assume that's where the the, the horses got into my blood from. Um, an interesting story with him. He actually um, at the the end would have been the um, he was in the um, the East African Company, and he at the end of the war decided to he wasn't going to go back with the rest of them. So he took a horse and a rifle and rode back to Johannesburg. Um, and um, said what saved him was his his horse lay down at night, so he could keep warm sleeping next to his horse. So it was. Yeah, I'm sure he had amazing stories, which I'm sad I never got to to talk to him about. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so. So he, he was he was from Ireland because Morrison is yes. Irish and you're on an Irish passport. Yeah, yeah. So he was from Ireland. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I went to a, a, sh a school show with a friend of mine. Um, it was at then at Sanic probably in about 1978 or so. And um, thought, gee, this looks nice. Um, I'd like to do this. So went off to BEC, which was where the Clavin, or opposite the Clavin at that intersection of Litkoppen, and started riding lessons. So the, back in the day, it was um, Isabel, I think it was Isabel Jeans at that stage, Isabel Favay, taught me in the, the round school, sort of go up and down. Then I moved on. Rogan was teaching there. Um, was was uh, that was that where Chinter Park used to be? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was called BEC. Um, it was owned by the Taylors. Um, 
and um, then um, yeah, so I rode a little bit with Rogan there, and then progressed on to Willie Peters, and he he ran the, the yard at that stage, mm -hmm. and he was I think he's married to Bev Taylor then, um, and they got divorced, and he left and went to Carswell, and I I followed Willie. Um, and it was a school. Was it, were, were those the days of Ascot Fever? And yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Ascot Fever, and he had a he had a chestnut as well. I can't think of the name. Um, but yeah, Ascot Fever was that was those were the days. And um, the we went to Carswell, um, and there was a school pony that that was uh, that he had at at um, BEC, which he then persuaded my parents to to buy for me. Which they did for five hundred rand. Um, which in those uh, days was probably a handsome sum. It was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we. I then bought a Steuben saddle from from Daryl at Western Shop for about fifty rand. Um, <laughs> so um, and um, yeah, that um, well, that was really the start of my riding. Then um, then at cars it was when Anna and, and Jonathan cousins were there. Um, I stayed with Willie there, and then we went to Old Carswell, and then Willie went to um, Lanceria, which was just too far for my my mom to travel. She didn't want to go all the way out there, and um, we rented a yard in in Glenfinnes, and did our courses ourselves. So did everything ourselves. And um, before school, got up in the morning, drove across. We lived in Bryanston. Drove to, to Glen Furness and, and did the horses there. Went back to school, came back in afternoon to ride. Um, and then I rode with a lady at um, who's based at Ascot Stables, um, Elaine Mitchell. And she did a lot of, she was a dressage rider um, and did a bit of eventing. And um, she one day said, No, look, you you need to go to Gonda. So she phoned Gonda. Gonda said, Look, I don't teach kids, but send him anyway. Just send him, and I can have a have a lesson with her, and you know, carry on with the lane. So I went to Gonda's, and um, yeah, she liked the way I rode, and I so I must have been about twelve then. And she said, "Okay, I can have lessons with her." So I used to ride from Glen Finesse, ride all the way up for a lesson, have a lesson, ride back again, and from one lesson a week went to two a week. And then about a year later, Gonda said, "Look, you know." Come and stable there with me, and I was still on the same school pony, Mosman. Um, and um, that stage, I think I was jumping CB. I couldn't get out. I had one point to get to go CA, and I couldn't. Yeah, you got your points in those days was like four, three, two, one. Mm. And I just, uh, I couldn't get my my last point to go to CA before I turned juniors. I was just, ah. I was too slow, which is seems to. So I've been slow for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then um, yeah, I went juniors and um, I rode at the Rand, um, Rand show, old Rand show at Moonlight Park um, mm. in a pairs event with Gonda and then turned juniors and kept the pony um, and within six months I was jumping Jay on, on him um, he was just not, not a gallopy fast pony for, for the the pony classes, mm. but in the junior classes, um, he was unbeatable. Um, so I stayed with him, tried a lot of horses in between, and rode quite a few. Um, I had a, a, a thoroughbred, a couple of thoroughbreds, a very good thoroughbred that was too much horse for me probably at the time. I was too small. Um, a horse called Harrow, um, that used to, used to fall off every time I rode him. Um, and um, yeah, so why, I, why do you say that? Was he naughty? I oh, used to buck. Yeah, he just I just couldn't stay on. He just I oh, used to catapult me just right out the saddle. I just was he bucked once and I every every time he bucked I fell off. I couldn't I could not stay on. Um and he eventually killed yeah, I got bucked off in a lesson at Gonda and landed on the fence. And um he galloped to the stables and her geese then at that stage sort of flared up in front of him and he, he killed her geese. So she said, right, that's it. End, end of the source. You know, and, and he was then sold. I, I think that week he was gone. 
sold to he went to Zaire to the to the Congo or something. Mm, um, with a reputation as a goose killer. Yeah. Um and um yeah, then then I, I sold that pony. Um I so I rode him till about sixteen. Um and then Gonda organized me two horses to ride. Um a horse called the Wasp that I jumped in JB and a horse called Palladium. And I jumped him in the JAs. Um, they were both owned by different people and um, rode those horses for them for the rest of my junior career. Um, did very well in juniors on Palladium. And um, Palladium went on to, I think Johan Lotter got him off. And it was okay. Johan Lotter's sort of first junior horse after that. Um, and then, so yeah, a successful then junior career and, and lots of yeah. wins yeah. and, and mm. made the teams, the junior teams and... Who who were some of who were the, the riders in your era when you were competing in junior? Who who were the your fellow teammates, your compatriots? Um, so the Jewers, obviously they were all like um, Sandra was was the same kind of time as me. Um, the the Blacklocks, um, mm. Stephen Blacklock um, and Jason Blacklock. Um, a lot of the guys don't don't ride much anymore. Um, a lot of them were older than me, um, Mark mm. Stafford. Um, so by riding the J's when I was 14, I, I rode with a lot of the older crowd, Jacques Neyman, Craig Zietzman, um, those guys. Um, and then, yeah, in my, uh, I suppose Gavik was a little bit younger than me. Um, and um, yeah, Nicola Chin, um, yeah, it was, it was like George Philippides was, was mm. a little bit, a little bit younger than me, um, and um, yeah, Rogan's crowd of, of kids there, Gunnarvach, um, Stephen Scher, um, all those guys, um, the Ellerines, um, mm. uh, Kevin and Bradley. Um, okay. So, San Sandra could ride a horse, huh? Oh, she's a great rider. Yeah, I think she rode very well. Yeah, great, great feel. Huge amount of so, feel. Yeah. Um, and teams, you made all the teams and SA champs and all that kind of stuff. Were you uh, were you setting a good example for your son to follow in? Because he's done pretty well in juniors. Yeah, he's done done very well. He can he's got a, he's got a much longer list of achievements than I had. I was um, yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, he can he can tell you about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I had a bit of a break from riding after after that. I went to the army, um, and um, it was going to go to Pretoria to ride and then I was going to that we got posted out of there and I was going to go back then I ended up doing officers course and and went to the border um, and then came back I rode in my last three months in the army um, mm -hmm. but based in Pretoria uh, I had a, a black horse there called Kuwait which was um, yeah, I think Evan, Evan Anderson rode him and Andre Sander rode him as well um, mm -hmm. and um, you know it was my my claim to fame on that also was I was I was third in I think the medium A grade Grand Prix at um, Sun City um, or medium A grade championships. Um, third and Jeff Billington was Jeff Billington won it. I can't even remember who was second. I was just so in awe of, of Jeff Billington and being in the same lineup as as him. It was was amazing. Yeah. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. When when you were in the when you were in the army, who were some of the guys with you? That same crowd, Gunnar and, and all of them, or were they in cavalry yeah. and, and had uh, Peter yeah. Stark moved out, or was he still? Well, I was I was with the after runs at um, at Victoria. Okay. Um, with Brenda Cook was there. Um, um, uh, Gunnar was also there. Um, or I think Gunnar might have been a year ahead of me. Um, and. Um, yeah, I think Brenda was there. Yeah, not not too many guys in Pretoria. Most of the guys were in Pot. Um, mm. So I wasn't in Pot for those guys. I was in Pretoria only for a short time right at the end. Um, Philip Lacey was, was based in Pretoria there. Mm. Um, mm. So. And um, adults is where it really happened for you. Um, tell us some of your wonderful horses you've had had in the adults and the I mean you you you're you're there in all the big shows and all the world cups and the derbies. And I mean, you've had a, you've had a wonderful time in adults. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I didn't ride for 10 years. So from, from when I was 20 until when I was 30. 
Why? Um, it's try, trying to grow a business. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, whether I wanted to go game ranging or, or work in a business. And I, I did a lot of different stuff and triathlons and I ran comrades and a lot of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then realized that actually what I really wanted to do was horses mm -hmm. and, and, and ride. So I got back into riding at one, I suppose, 29 or 30. Um, and yeah, I had a, um, a horse. I actually, when I started riding again, I went to um a girlfriend of mine had a, a horse well, hang horse. on I, I, i'm interested you you said i didn't even know this other other sporty side of of you comrades and so, so you've always had an interest in other sports and been very athletic hmm. yeah my my brother is very sporty um he played cricket for transvaal at that stage and and natal and hockey for transvaal and natal um and he was a very good runner so he got me into the the running side of things um and um yeah and i i, I enjoyed I, I mean i loved running i, I um ran a lot um, ran most of the ultra marathons there are um in in south africa anyway and um yeah a lot of triathlons um a lot of canoeing um i did um, so i was quite busy through that that whole time doing that i even raced off road bikes for a while motorbikes and things mm. um that's where, yeah, the, that's where the back of, problems happen you probably, can't blame yeah. horses. Yeah, I think it was prob probably as, as a, a result of those 10 years of exploring all sorts of other yeah. things. Yeah. Um, um, and, and canoeing, what, like professional doozy and all that? Um, not the doozy. I had a lot of, um, some river paddling, um, but not, um, not the doozy. I did most of the, the flat water paddling um, was, was what I, I did. And, and that was really... For the triathlons at that stage triathlons were either the swimming wasn't big in the triathlons it was in it was was paddling so i got into to that and it was you know the focus was the triathlons for me and, and i enjoyed those i i i i would love to do triathlons but i can't run i can't swim and i can't ride a bike so it's kind of rules rules yeah, I, me out the, the 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 swimming ones now they all swim swim triathlons and I'm not a great swimmer so that uh, now I stick to horses. Yeah. And, and Peter's school, where did, where did you go to school? Were you born and bred and raised born. Transvaal, Gauteng and, and have been yeah. around here your whole life? Born and bred in, in Joburg so I grew up in Bryanston and I went to St. Stadion's College um, and yeah so I lived in Bryanston and then yeah I had the horses in, in Glen Finesse and Kyle Army so okay. I mean those early days, there was, you know, Lone Hill didn't exist. Uh, we used mm. to go through art rides through Lone Hill where there wasn't a single house. It was just mm. a film studio at the, at the little copy there. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Things have changed. Um, mm. So you got back into it when you were around 30. How, how difficult a, a transition was it to, to come back? Because it means buying all the kit, the, the horses, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, I um, as I said, I had a girlfriend who, who was into horses and um, she had a friend who had a horse at, at Errol's and the friend wasn't riding the horse and, and said to me, would I go and ride it for them and sit in it? And so I rode it a few times and then Errol saw me riding this, this horse and we were chatting and he said, look, there's another horse standing at the yard. Um, I mean, it doesn't have time for it. It was called East of East. Um, it was jumping the B grades. So he said, well, do I not want to ride that? So I did. Um, and um, so it was really Errol who got me back into proper competing. And it happened quite fast. It was literally within, he, he said he'd been riding the horse a bit and things. And it was entered in the show um, a week later. I gave it a jump, road run. A week later, I was jumping it in the C grades. And then... Um, jumping I think one or two C grade shows and then then into the B grades and those. So within probably two months, I was back back and riding and 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 competing. Um, so and it then, never yeah, went think, away. The the feel was always there. The, the like they says like riding a bike. Hmm. Yeah, just came back and it was good. And um, Errol helped me a lot. He was very good to me. Um, and I, I think, yeah, with, if it hadn't been for Errol kind of giving me those opportunities, I don't think I would have 
well, I might still have got back into it, but I, I suddenly realized then that, you know, this is what I've been missing and this is what I want to do. Mm. Um, and then, um, yeah, I went to, um, she was an older, I think she must have been 15 or 16 at the stage, um, or at that stage. So I, I probably rode her for about a year. Um, and then, um, um, yeah, I went back to Gondo for a bit for some lessons then um, as well. And bought a, a young man called Mosaic. Um, went on one a, a trip with Rogan and a few guys, Rogan and Simon Byrne and guys from Eastern Cape to go and look for horses. And I bought Mosaic from, from Diane. Um, it was a Namibian warm blood, um, 18 hands. Um, it was an enormous horse. Um, and um, yeah, she, she really got me back. And I suppose I jumped her up to the, the 140s. Mm. Um, she wasn't was, was she already was she already produced and going when you no. when you got her? No, she was a four. So you, you did all the formative work and you brought her on. I brought her on. Um, so yeah, I brought her on up. I, I really like doing it. I, I I brought on pretty much most of my horses. Um, and um, yeah, she she was a, a super. Horse. She she really she was brave. Um, for me at that stage, kind of getting back into it was was really exactly what I needed. Um, I could make some mistakes. It didn't really matter. She'd keep going. Um, you, you knew you were going to see the finish. Um, she, she'd probably have one or two down, but yeah, she was, she was a nice horse for the, the time for, for me at that time. She was, a, she was a good horse. Um, and she went and, how far to the one forties? Yeah. I jumped in the one forties was, was, was an end. And then, um, I sold her. Um, and bought a horse called Aquanaut. Um, David Wilkin had been riding him. Um, he was owned by Hans Lou in, in Garden Cape Town. Um, and also, I, he was a stallion, um, first stallion that I'd had. And um, yeah, he, he taught, me, taught me a lot, taught me a lot about stallions. Um, and I think probably, had I, if, I, if I had him now, I probably would have made him a, a better horse. Um, I, he, he was, it's quite, he was, he was a different horse at home or, or in the warm up to what he was in the ring. He, he was, he wasn't that brave. Um, he was quite careful. Um, and being a stallion, you, you couldn't get away with making mistakes. Um, and I think then I was too ambitious of trying to jump in, in two big, bigger classes. And, um, so I had a couple of years where I battled with him, um, but I think in hindsight it was my own fault of trying. To, of my aspirations were were bigger than his, um, mm. and um, I think that's that's actually stood me in good stead to to know and and bring on horses and make sure that they they come to not jump them out of their comfort zone until they're ready. Or if you do push a horse, to always go back again and. And go back to the basics and, and instill confidence. And a horse has got to want to do it. They've got to really want to do it for you. Um, you know, it's it's very hard to to force horses around um, tracks that they shouldn't be jumping. Um, no, it's a and, partnership. But interesting, yeah. something you say um, that you couldn't make mistakes on him because he was a stallion. Why do you say that? Because you find stallions more sensitive. They're hyper tuned more than other horses. Yeah, they're less forgiving. So they'll take it, they'll take it for a little bit, but they never forget. So Stalins have they they never forget. If you you make um mistakes on a on a stallion and, and you can they they'll they'll fight they they've got more self preservation than a gelding. Mm. Um and um you know you do obviously and, and characters of, of stallions and characters of horses are all different. But yeah, for me I I definitely think stallions you've got to be a little bit more cautious with in terms of what you and and he was obviously a warm blood stallion where did you get him from and what what was his pedigree and and was he a breeding stallion um yeah so another thing which i, I learned from me he was a um he was by attila um okay so the the minute he was under pressure so attila used to stand up a little bit in the corners and, and things like that the minute i remember with him, miranda yeah, yeah. so the minute Aquanaut was under pressure, he would do the same thing. Um, 
you know, so you could be having a beautiful round and then the next thing he would just you know, throw in the towel and, and, and stand up in the corner. And um, we, we didn't breed with him at all. Um, but I then, because I, I jumped the Shanguini derby on him um, and I'd really had to, to I scrubbed him around and it was, you know, we, we saw the finish, but it was, it wasn't pretty. And um, I, we decided to geld him um, after that. Um, I jumped a lot of Grand Prix on him as a stallion, um, but never felt he was good enough to, or, or he didn't have the expert to go and jump the World Cup. Um, and um, he was a much better horse after we gelded him. Um, mm. Much better horse, but I then kept him more in the 140 classes. Um, and then I actually had a, had, had a great time. So it took me two or three years to, to work it out. Um, and then once, once what, the what were the what were the fundamental differences with the gelding that he just lost that kind of self preservation mode and it, it was more of a partnership less about less yeah. about himself less about himself and more focused on 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 me um, and I think that he 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 didn't he he would lose his focus quite quickly um, and and then the minute he lost focus and concentration he would suck off the fences and then. And you just find yourself in trouble. You're never getting to the thing. Um, and um, yeah, after he was gelded, he was a he, he was a much better horse. Um, and yeah, we should have been, you know that that type of horse. And I think any horse that you're not breeding with to keep them in the stallion just for the sake of keeping them in the stallion is mm. is not good. He was a he was a difficult stallion, um, difficult around other horses. Um, not when you're riding him. It's an absolute pleasure. It's beautiful to ride. But but in the stables and and things like that, he he was quite quite a handful. Mm. Um, and I think if you've got a stallion and you're breeding with him, like we've had, and I've had a lot of stallions since then that have been breeding stallions, and but they they've got to know their job and separate their job from what they're doing. Um, and I, I yeah, I, he wasn't a breeding stallion, and and I would have if I did it again, I would have gelded at him as a, a sort of seven year old. Mm. I'm, I'm glad you've touched on that because um, there are people out there who just like the idea of having a stallion because they regal and noble and they puff themselves out and it's a great picture but that comes with a lot of complications and in my book it's not fair to keep them a stallion if you if no. they're not if they it must be incredibly frustrating for a horse we don't know what you know um, and a lot of I've, I've heard a lot of horses jumping horses stallion horse stallions actually get quite sore testicular soreness pain yeah, um, sure. and it affects their and, and it can affect their jumping yeah no, i'm sure it does and uh you know i think uh, he, he was he really taught me a lot that was and I, I um i think from a point of view of him you know just just to keep a horse stallion like that where you've got to keep them like we try to socialize him and keep him with other horses but he hadn't grown up being socialized and being with other horses mm. Mm. So he was quite aggressive, um, and you know, not to handle it all. He was he was super towards people, but to other horses, he was quite aggressive. Mm. And then, you know, from that, there's a whole lot of complications that that come with it. And and mm. for me, I I just want to ask you on on the topic of stallions because you guys do have breeding stallions now, and obviously, warm blood breeding is all AI, but they've still got to go to the clinic and jump the phantom. Um, do you find that it changes their behavior during breeding season? They're always more of a handful during breeding season. So you've got to manage their, their energy and their, their temperaments because they can, be, they can be sort of fairly flat and you know, not really coming off your leg and they don't concentrate. And then suddenly you can get in the in the warm-up or in the ring and they've they've smelt a mare and they they suddenly alive completely alive and you might have fed fed them up a bit to get them to get the energy levels up and then you get into the warm-up and i find it with with numerology he can be like a, and then suddenly he's he's completely over the top um mm -hmm. and it's just the excitement and they seem to so they do change quite quickly in their, their hormones and, and they can be different from one day to the next. But especially especially before breeding season, find coming up to breeding season and right at the beginning, they're more stallion-y and towards other horses, especially our two stallions, they have a bit 
they can mm. try show off to each other. Um, yeah. But once they start breeding season, they sort of calm down a little bit. Yeah, yeah they said yeah. once they've actually yeah, once they've started breeding, they seem to settle down a little bit. Take the lid off the pressure cooker, I guess. Do you guys yeah. do any um, live covers with the horses, or yeah. is it all AI? All AI. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that live covers would make it worse? Uh, definitely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I, I think it's 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 quite dangerous for the the stallions. I know that's that's all they, they do in the racing, but then those horses are their careers, their sports careers are over. Um, you know, I, it's I find it quite traumatic, and and when the horses are when when the stallions are covering anyway, um, you know, there's lots that can go wrong. Um, so it's quite stressful, and and often you know you can't say okay, well, the stallion somebody wants to covering from your stallion, you and it's middle of the breeding season, you can't say well, okay, I can't bring him today because he's jumping at a show tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Then if, if the mare's cycling, they need they they want it done and there and then. So you know, you should might be sitting the day before the World Cup show starts, and your stallion's covering, and you going, geez, okay, hope he doesn't slip. I hope nothing goes yeah. goes wrong. So yeah, it's, it's stressful. I think live covering would be, be even more stressful, and and then they'd probably associate. I mean, they obviously know what what the mares are anyway, but mm. they would then. I think you, have, you run more risk of them climbing onto mares and things in the warm up and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We digress. Carry on with your story. Um, yeah, where was I? Um, Aquanaut. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, then um, I, I, I then sold Aquanaut. Um, not for a lot of money. He was in, he was, I suppose, past his, his prime. He was probably 14 or so. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was looking for something else um, and I had a, a small budget and saw this horse jump at, at Domini's. Um, saw him jump one fence and I thought, sure, that looks really nice. But um, he looked very difficult to ride. Um, he had a rope nose band and a standing martingale and, and things. And so I said, um, is he? For sale, and Connie Stark was riding him, and she was riding for for the owls who stud at that stage. And they said, "Yes, he's you know he's he's one of the stud horses. He's one of the, the horses at the stud store. Um, hadn't been sold. Been tried by quite a few people, and, and no one got along with him. So I asked the price, and it sort of fitted in my budget. So I said, okay, and I I had a had a sit on him, and um, and I jumped. Uh, two, I think, two verticals, and I, I went right through them both. I, he just would just run down. The minute you you wanted to steady him, he threw his head in there and he just ran. And, um, and he had a big knee from obviously doing that before. Mm. And um, so I, I said, look, let me, I'll get off. I'll come back tomorrow and um, bring us back tomorrow. Let me have a sit when there's no one around and I can spend a bit of more time and have a sit on him. And I jumped and it, it went a little bit better. It wasn't wasn't fantastic, but he was at least I could kind of get him and, and we were we were clearing some of the, the jumps, albeit at a, a meter or a meter ten. Mm. And um he, he would still run down, but I but I was managing to keep him off the fence. And I jumped down a line. Um it was a, a vertical 45 strides down to an oxer. And I expected him to jump the vertical and run down to the oxo and he just never did he just stayed exactly as he was so i jumped the vertical and i finished the five strides with about you know probably three meters still to go to get to the the oxo and it was now this is probably at about a meter 30 put it up just to see what he was like and i thought well if i don't put my leg on here i'm dead we're just mm -hmm. gonna i just i put my leg on and he just, he took off and he just went, he sailed over the top of the uprights, over the thing, over the oxer, landed on the other side, picked his head, stayed around. I patted him. My heart was pounding in my chest. I thought I was, I'd survived this. And I said, okay, I'll buy him. Um, took and I out your checkbook, signed the deal. 
And that and was um, you, you didn't you didn't mention the name, but I'm assuming that's Luanda. That was Luanda. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, and how and how the, old was he at, at this stage? He was six. Okay. So um, it's it's yeah, such it's so remarkable you say that because you look at him today and he's got this natural ability to back himself off the fence completely. I mean, he'll run to a fence, he'll pick his head up, and he just choop, and and up he comes. Um, yeah. So I got to ask you about the retraining and 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 how you taught him those lessons. Um, so his his flat quick training was 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 quite nice. Um, he, he was okay, and I I just took everything off and and put him in a a, a rubber snaffle, um, and started again. Just started to try and get him to so he, you could the minute you touch his mouth, he flicked his head. Um, okay, now I've got to, I've got to stop you here because this brings up up a point. What what bit was he in in when you got him? I actually don't don't remember, but it was quite strong. I think they they, they tried all sorts of things. So um, so so this is this is what I want to say. Um, in your experience, horses pull, people go stronger. Horses pull, people go stronger again. But sometimes the trick is to go the so, other way to go well okay. why are you pulling if you've got nothing to pull against it's like a tug yeah. of war if there's a team on the one end of the rope and the team on the other end is not pulling you know you've got, nothing to pull on. Yeah. you've got nothing to pull against so was that your thinking well let's just That's go the other way and start again yeah so that was my thinking um and um i did a a lot of um canter i had a, a row of in the end about 19 trotting poles and I would canter to the, the trotting poles and say, whoa, and not touch his mouth. And then trot through the trotting poles and, and did a lot of that. It was just part of my flat with every single day. That's what I did. With I'm imagining um, the first time you did that, it didn't quite go according to plan. No, 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 it, was, it, was, it wasn't pretty. Suicide but, by trotting pole. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it... Um, so yeah, that is where we started with him, and did yeah, did a lot of that. Um, and then he was he got better and much better, got better and better. Um, I hardly ever used running reins or, or anything on him. Um, I when I started jumping him smaller tracks, um, I used a sort of variation of a, a de Gogue, but it didn't go through the the bit. It just went just put a little bit of head pressure. So if he flicked his head, nothing caught his mouth. Um, and it just put a bit of pole pressure on. Um, and there was a, a stirrup leather to a piece of orange string over his pole. Um, and I did that just trained at home like that um, so that I could touch his mouth and, and could wait because without, I mean, you can't jump on a track when you can't touch your horse's mouth. Mm. Um, and he got more com comfortable, I think, with a softer bit. Um, and I suppose it took, um, I mean, it, it Probably a couple of years before he really was was going well enough and, and properly schooled and, and, and respected it. Um, I jumped. I think my first clear round was in Durban at the Cyril Gugan Stadium, um, and it was a clear round of the time fault in the 135 championships, um, and I was ecstatic. And that was probably two years later. Um, Your so, first clear round, why did he have, did, because he was still pulling yeah, he, to fences, he would kick yeah, out the front went, rails, or are you talking about that whole horrid time penalty that's no, played you pretty, seemingly would, your would, whole life? He would jump a brilliant round, but he would then, you know, if, if you yeah, needed to pull or needed, he, he would lose it, you know, there would be one fence where you wouldn't get it spot on and you would run down yeah. to anything. So, um, and um, yeah, so it was probably two years before I really, you know, and, and then when I, I, I remember that, you know, it was the most, most pleasant time fault I ever got was yeah. that left with the jump up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But now yeah, I hang on a sec, because, because the system was different. What, what, what system was in play? Was it the rider classification or was it the old days where you had the horses had to accumulate the points? Um, no, I think then it was rider classification. You could okay. jump, jump anywhere you wanted to. So, because I mean, in I, the I, old days, you would still be sitting in D grades. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, he, he probably did jump in the meter tens and meter twenties. He probably jumped out here, but that was like my meaningful, like a, a meaningful yeah. round where he yeah. actually jumped proper. Yeah. But it's I come knew, together. Okay. No, I knew then I've got it. Um, I've now, yeah. I've, I've got it. Um, and um, yeah, he just from there went from strength to strength. Anyway, I'm, so I'm so just cool. picturing the scene because spectators and other riders, you don't know what goes on with a horse behind the scenes. See you come and canter through the finish with a time fault and ecstatic, and they're yeah. thinking, "Well, Peter, you just you 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 just had a time fault," yeah. but they don't know what an achievement it's. Yeah, yeah. and that's so, that's yeah. that's the, the glory of sport because yeah. a lot of times riders, I know I'm I'm one of them. You'll be far happier with a really really good round than a win. Like if you're galloping yeah. for a win and it's a bit untidy, but but you win. There's sometimes less satisfaction in that than when you jump a really good round on a problem horse where things are just coming together. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that is the beauty of the sport. You can jump, jump a great round and have an unlucky rail and come out thinking, shit, that was such a good round. And mm. you, can, you can also jump clear and go, okay, I'm lucky, you know, lucky to have survived that. So it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a great sport. Um, and mm. the satisfaction that you get on a, that, those sort of personal wins that you have with horses, it's not about winning the, the Grand Prix. It can be yeah. about the journey of that horse and where yeah. you come from. You know? Yeah. And, and that that's, that's why I try and advocate, you know, that there is so much, yes, it's nice to go and buy a made horse and go straight up into the big classes and jump nice rounds. But to me, it's a bit like winning the lotto, you know, mm. you, the, the, there is satisfaction, but the journey that you come on with producing a young horse, that bond that you grow with together and where everything just starts fitting into place, that's far more rewarding. Yeah, that's very, that is, it, it is very rewarding. And, and young horses, I, I, I love doing young horses and, and watching them progress and, and teaching them. And, and you learn so much from different horses. Um, and I think you, for well, us as riders, you can you can learn something from every horse. Every horse teaches you something, um, mm. and it's um, there. There's some very special ones, and building that partnership. And I think Luanda for me is a, he's just he's been the most unbelievable horse. He really was, mm. or is um, a great horse, and and would would fight for you, you know. And and you knew if you were in, if I were in the ring, I knew that you know my my favorite thing was was in a World Cup where there weren't any clears or, you know, I, I knew I could, you know, he would feel it and, and I, I knew we could go clear, you know, it was mm. that, that, which is a great feeling. You go in the ring knowing that he's going to fight, fight for you. you know, it's, mm. um, and it, again, it comes back to what you were saying earlier about them having to enjoy it. They've got to be part of the partnership. When you get mm. on their back and you walk them down to the school, you, you, they've got to, they've got to want to do it, and he's obviously yeah. a horse that really enjoyed, enjoyed the game. Yeah, and and a huge character. I mean, he's just, he's, he's the, he's the, he's a gentle soul in the stable. He's a nightmare on an outright, but he has the most fun of. I mean, and he loves it. I mean, you, you have the truck. He runs into the truck to go to a show. Mm. Um, we were now nice, through lockdown, and she. He's retired now, so we haven't. He, he, no one rides him, but he still is is in the stable yard. And we were riding in the field um, near where his paddock is, and, and jumping in the field. And he's fucking and galloping up and down the paddock, just sort of wanting to be part of it, you know, wanting to be yeah. either. And yeah, it just shows. Yeah, there's some special horses. He's still yeah. the king of the stable. Yeah, he goes out yeah. the paddock every day, like King Kong. You have to hold on to him. Well, I mean, Peter, you you were telling me like at a show he's a handful as well, a couple of times, including at yeah. Derby before the main class, he's gotten loose and terrorized uh, terrorized the, the yeah. showgrounds. I was um, I was walking walking the course um, for the Derby, and I think I was I was eighth or ninth in, and I came, I walked the course, came out, and I, he wasn't there. I couldn't find him. So I couldn't find him, couldn't find my groom. So I then, my groom comes running up with him 
trotting along behind him down from towards the gate and he got away from my groom um, and galloped all the way to the main gate of, and um, they stopped him there caught him and then brought him back um, thank goodness I was walking the course because I didn't know any of this was going on yeah um, got on to him and um, he was sweating already he was like it was, it was hot and he was he was drenched so I said well I'm not going to I don't have to try to canter around. So I just by this time I was late anyway. I only had three or four horses to go to me. Um, got on, went up into the, the warm up in the, the stubs there, cantered across, and he, he normally would canter down to the cross and he would he'd fly leap and buck. It was his his thing. And he knew, okay, he's and any big class and the clapping would would drive him mad. He would buck and play in the warm up and he was dead. He was just there was nothing. He kind of he fell uh, over the clock. So I jumped, I jumped one vertical. I jumped a big oxer and he kind of just flopped over the oxer. He didn't do anything. So I thought, okay, well, let me jump a, a tall vertical and go in. Um, I jumped the vertical and he just, he, he jumped it, but he didn't really, he didn't push, he didn't do anything. He just, just jumped it because it was there. So I said to Malira, I said, go and give me a pair of spurs. I didn't ride him in spurs. I said, I, yeah, I'll never get round here on a horse like this. Mm. And this is so, the derby now? This is the derby. Okay. So we, um, I went into the, the gate. Malira ran to the truck, got my spurs. I was standing at the gate, putting my spurs on. My bell went while I was standing at the gate, put my spurs on, cantered into the arena, cantered around, cantered to jump number one, Kicked him up because he was like, he normally would run down to me. He was just, just flopping like, kicked him up with the spurs. Jump number one beautifully. And I thought, okay, maybe. Jump number two, and he felt unbelievable. And I said to him, I said, now my boy, we're going to go clear. And he did. He went down a foot in the water. Um, he landed on the tape, which is my fault. I under rode the water. Um, and yeah, he jumped a clear around, foot in the water, and um, and a time fault. Um, I remember Barry. The time fault. So, 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 did you change the plan? So every show you subsequently went to, when you walked the course, you told the groom just to let him have a gallop around the showgrounds and and uh, bring he, out your pair of spurs. He did it. Um, so he did that at the Derby. He did it at um, at Rebel World Cup. Um, Got away, great galloped around the place. Cape Town World Cup, he got away from the groom. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, he jumped. The, I think those, maybe, maybe I shouldn't let him get away at all of them, but he did. He, he had a good record. He jumped from, you know, a lot of clear rounds and a lot of rounds of time for I think in, he jumped, I'm not sure of the exact number, but 20, 24, 25 World Cups. And his worst score in a World Cup was 12 falls. Um, sure. In all of those. So, what, what were some of your best finishes? Um, I was third in um, uh, Songweni um, in the in the World Cup. Songweni, um, a lot of fourths and and fourths and fifths. Um, obviously, he was he was not the fastest horse in a jump off. So um, in Songweni, I, I, I should have won it. Um, I was I think the only clear. Um, and um, in the jump off, I hit the last, um, and um, Nicole and Sean were both faster than me. That had that had the rail in the in in the first round. Ah. Um, but I, I've um, got to ask you as a rider because what do you what is your worst to hit the first jump or the last jump? I think the last. Yeah. I think the first the first the first you've got too much to do afterwards so you kind of just you know, you you get it together and you say so right and you fight until the end and you yeah. hit the light and yeah that was my you, you was, think uh, you're uh, in with a shot and then oh. never, yeah. i kind of i came to that down to that last fence and i i was spot on and i just i kind of just let him jump it and i thought okay well you know and he he he, he hit the top row with his knees i mean he almost jumped a foot too low 
Mm. I think it was to do with the light in that arena. Um, it was mm. was dark and, he, and it was jumping in that bottom corner and it was it was quite dark at the time. That I think he just misjudged it. Um, but yeah, it was that's that's how it goes. That's yeah, that's, so. that's the sport. And um, and Peter, the derbies. Um, you had a foot in the water once. Was that your best derby round? Yeah, your, so your best finish. Um, I had two eight fault rounds, I think. Um, and then and then that one. Um, and the derbies are funny, you know. That year, there were four clear rounds, mm. um, and four clear rounds, one time fault. Um, so yeah, I was, I was fifth or sixth or something in the derby that year. Mm. Um, but any other year, you could have been second or gone into a four fault jump off. Fifth, that's the derby. Yeah, that's and that's the derby. You know, I I, I had an eight fault um, round the the year afterwards. Um, and I think that yeah, the derby was one on four faults. Mm. Um, you know, there was just a lot of four faults, and you know, I was also again six or seventh or something with eight faults. So yeah, the derby's. I think the derby. It's it's the greatest show we had, um, just from an atmosphere and the crowd, and mm. it's it, it's brilliant. Um, doesn't suit all horses, but the occasion is unbelievable. Um, yeah. That feeling to just go into the derby, and I don't think it. On your day, if, if you have the, you, if, if it's your day and you, your horse jumps well and you ride well and, and, and you go clear and you win the derby and there's guys who've, who've you know, won it on, on four faults and, and, and more and there's guys who've, who've been third and fourth on a clear run. Um, yeah. It's how everybody goes on the day. But the occasion, there isn't another show that we have that has that, that occasion. Um, yeah. You can't yeah. enter that arena, it's just unbelievable. Now, your, your back flared up, not for the first time, and that forced you off of uh, Luanda while you were recovering. Matthew took the ride. Mm. Was the plan that you would take Luanda back, or was it always that Matthew would keep the, keep the ride? So there Matthew was my, can tell was, the story. Yeah, there was my second back up. So I kind yeah. of, the rest of the family said, okay, that's it. So I'd already had one back up. This was now the second one. So they said, yeah, that's it. So I'd resign myself to give him to Matthew at that stage. Um, so yeah, Matthew can. I don't think that was the original plan, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the, your original plan, though, Matthew, and it stuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, you you had you had a wonderful. You were at the point in your career where you were you were well. Well, you tell me um, how much had you achieved up until that point? You'd come out of children's. You were a good children's rider. Yeah. So I I got Luanda when I was in children's. Um, so I must have been 12. I don't know what children's is. I think it is 12. So I had 100 runs. A thoroughbred um, mare that I got, she was jumping, I think, 90 centimeters. And I took her up into the children's and she won quite a lot. Um, and Luanda, you know, I had him um, for children's. And I think I won the children's derby on him along with a few other classes. Um, but then from there, we just went into the juniors and he was never a fast horse as it is. So mm -hmm. the junior classes were not his strongest point. Um, but but the, the perfect horse for you at that stage in your career because he was, as they say, the schoolmaster, been there, done that, and could give yeah. you the confidence that it didn't matter if you really made a few mistakes, the horse was there for you. And, and how important do you think that was in the evolution of your riding? Yeah, I think it was very important. Obviously, 100 runs was a hot, difficult horse. Um, and she taught me a lot. Um, and he sort of gave me the confidence to just get in the ring and jump. It didn't matter how big the jumps were or how tough the track was. He was quite a difficult horse to ride. Um, but that didn't really, it, it wasn't an issue because of the heart he had. Mm. Yeah. And of course, you, I mean, the horse had been with you all these years. You obviously knew him inside out, watched your dad, had watched your dad riding him. You, you knew, you knew the, the way into him. Yeah, it was quite difficult to get to learn him. Because um, I obviously, I had, I was, my pony career wasn't that great. I was, never had much of a pony career. Um, and then coming from a hot horse, Luanda was, very unorthodox and lazy and bouncy at the same time. 
so it was quite a difficult course to learn to ride um but i think i did in the end manage to get him and i wish i had him now you know as a horse to be jumping in those classes that his peak would be would be unbelievable but yeah now you say you have retired him there was some um well what what was the reason for his retirement so he he was he i mean bucked a lot and he bucked one day very very big with matthew in in, in the school at home um went very high and kicked out behind and you know sort of after that he just wasn't he, he was a little funny behind and he, he he would when he turned he would almost fall on 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 to one side mm. um if you turn him sharp um and better look at him and they couldn't really pinpoint what was wrong and then um eventually realized that he, he did actually fractured his sacrum um mm. doing that and um so we rested him for about a year um and he he tried sound but if you turn him really sharp um he he wants to fall a little bit over his hip um so we we just decided you know we he's he's done enough he he doesn't yeah. need to to do any more i'd hate to have a horse you know with a bit of an issue that that breaks down while you while you're riding i'd rather just that he's happy and he yeah he did he did get better at a stage obviously this was before we realized that he had back to the safe room so he was he was unsound and well, not unsound he trotted perfectly sound but he was just not right for quite a while and we gave him a good rest um and he came back and i think i jumped my first 140 on him would have been i think i was 14 then um and then that was he we rested him for a year after that um mm -hmm. and he just never really came back into it. Mm. Such a difficult area when they, um, you know, so, so much off of their push comes from yeah. that area. So it's very, very easy to aggravate it once again, if, yeah. if there is a scarring yeah. issue or a weakness there. Yeah. And like you say, he, he had done enough, but Peter, you've also got numerology and while Luanda was at the top of his game, you were producing the stallion. Tell me about yeah. him, where he came from, because he is Rivendell's, numerology where is he owned by you or is it in partnership with rivendell did they breed him how does how does the partnership uh, uh, work or is he just under their banner so corin cook and um, bred him so corin has has rivendell stuff and he i i went down there to the, to the start to go and um quote on an arena and she showed me um showed me another stallion actually called serendipity and I saw numerology with his head out of the, the stable window and I asked, who's that? And she told me about him. Um, that stage, I didn't know too much about his pedigree and, and, and things. I, I, I recognized some of the names, but that's about all. And um, she brought him out and I, just, I really liked him. I just thought he's, he's nice. He was two years old. Um, and um, she phoned me about a week later and said, do I want to buy him? Um, and I, I'm denied, and then I said, "Yeah, actually, I do. Let me." And and I bought him. Um, mm. So I I decided to. I could have bought him and and left breeding rights and things, but I, I decided to buy him outright. Mm. Um, and then brought him home. I left him there for about six months, and then brought him home as a two and a half year old. And then obviously I had Luanda at that time, and I had another horse called Octavius. Um, and um, so I just let yeah you know, let him tick along. We backed him as a as a three year old, and then turned him out for for six eight months and brought him back as a four year old. So I never really put any pressure on him. I just let him come along and um, mm. and he would just come to the shows with us, um, take along and you know he would go to all the big shows and then jump in the in the smaller class in the one tens and the one twenties. Yeah, before I knew it, he was he was in the one thirties. And um, yeah, then going going on to the one forties and and up, um, mm. and yeah, he's been a super super horse. Super yeah. scopy, powerful, ticks all the right boxes. Um, is a stallion. 
you breed with him. He, he does yeah. the, the, the AI, so he is being used. He's got a wonderful pedigree. His yeah. temperament as a stallion, when you say just used to tag along to the shows? He's the most relaxed guy. He's, he's got such a great temperament. He's great with people. Um, he's got no vices at all. Um, he's good with other horses. Um, he's, he's a very relaxed stallion, very, you know, he can, he'll get a little bit stallion -y when there's a, a mare around, um, but you can put him next to a gelding in the truck. There's no problem. He stands next to you, you'll say next to another stallion in the truck. He's, you know, he's a very, very easy horse. He's quite, I mean, he's a big horse and luckily he's so easy because he could quite easily push you over and, and push you around, but he doesn't, he's, he's mm. just a nice guy. Yeah. And easy horse to ride, no vices, doesn't pull. Does he get strong? He does get strong. Um, he's very sensitive. Um, I think the numero unos are, are, can be quite sort of sensitive and hot. He's very, very spooky, um, but not in the ring. Um, so he's spooky at everything around. Um, you know, he, he walks on his toes and, and will spook and spin. Um, he's, he's never, he's never really bucked ever um, with me on his back. He bucks in the paddock and plays. Um, but he, yeah, he can really spook. Um, and that, that's his, his, his thing. So if you hack him out or if you work in the school and things like that, he can spook and spin and, um, and if he gets upset about something, his reaction is to run a bit. So if something upsets him, he will he'll run and then he can get quite strong. Um, so my training with him is to try and keep him as, as quiet and relaxed as possible. Um, and not to rev him up too much. Um, again, going back to the, the bits, I've, I've always tried to keep him in something quite, quite soft. Um, towards the middle of last year, middle to end of last year, I put him in a, a Hackmore combination. Um, and he was great, but he actually got, got stronger and stronger. Um, and this year, I've been a lot of time in lockdown now, I've focused on, I've gone right back to, to soft um, and a lot of training over small jumps and small exercises and and you now i've enjoyed the time doing the the, the schooling work and, and stuff that i through work and business don't really get time for um and, and trying to do, do a lot of that but he's he's a lovely horse to ride he's a, he's a real I'm, I'm glad yeah. you touched on on that that's um put him in a in a different bit but brought him back because a lot of the time people think bits are a quick remedy, a quick fix to something where actually the problem lies within the schooling and going back to the groundwork and working it out in something that's very simple will benefit you far more than trying to fix it with a, with a bit. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, last year, because I had a, had another backup last year in, in April. I think. Um, so I didn't really ride for six months and got back quite quickly into it. And, and Matt had been riding and he was, he, he got, stronger and a bit and, and really it was my fault in that I probably hadn't done enough work with him again and, and got quite quickly back up and, and jumping again and jumping him in the World Cups and things. Um and a and a stronger bit worked for a short time. And then I realized that that is, you know, we now need I need to go back again to the basics and, and that and lockdown's given me that opportunity with him to yeah. Go back and do the flat work, and uh, he's he's in a in his old bit again, and he's 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 really doing his mm -hmm. again. And it, his so, yeah. um, his progeny, because I mean, he would he would bring a lot of power to the mix, a lot of scope. What sort of mares does he suit? And have you seen some of his progeny? How old would they be now? Um, so we have one at at Karen's, um that'll be coming three. Um, that was on to a, um, a for Joy mare. Um, she was a bit short legged and lacked a little bit of canter. She jumped in a beautiful shape and, and, and frame. Um, so he's given that horse you know, nice long legs. Um, and um, he, he's very uphill himself. Um, so that role is, is long legs, uphill, um, scopey looking horse. Um, you know, we. Probably two and a half now, so I don't really know what he's what he's going to be like. But I, I've, I've got high hopes for him. I think he's he's a nice type. Um, Renee Free has a, a, a super um, 
quote from him um, out of um, what is her maid's name? Alaska. Uh, Alaska. Okay. So that's great. That, that's when they yes. hit. Um, that's a, a really, that's a beautiful, um, beautiful that they'll be 18 months now. Mm -hmm. or two, yeah, two years old probably. Um, and is, is he in demand as a stallion? Is he getting quite a few mares every yeah. year? Yeah. So it's, it obviously started slowly. I didn't breed with him until he was, I suppose, um, seven, seven or eight. Eight. Um, yeah. Be the, the the yeah. yeah. So, so eight was, and um, for the simple reason, I want him to, to learn his job as a, as a, a show jumper and, and do his thing and then, and then started breeding. Um, and um, yeah, he's since probably covered, since then has covered, um, up to maybe six, seven, eight mares a year. Um, that he does say so he's got more and more in demand, and I think it's now that he's jumping in the World Cup, so people um, can see what he's doing. He's he's much more in demand. I think it it was a pity for him as soon as he was getting into the World Cups, and as a nine year old, then my dad started to have the back problems again, and then he broke his ankle. So he sort of got in and then came back down, and then went up again and came back down. So he hasn't, he yet, had he, he, he hasn't had a full Cup. season yeah. in the World Cup yet. So. It's, 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 been, it's been tough going for your dad and maybe a little bit tough going for the horse that he... But, I mean, he is still relatively young, so it wouldn't have done him a disservice to come back down and play a bit and build some more confidence. And, of course, the big benefactor here is you, Matthew, because you took the ride on him for a, for a while as well. Yeah. I made sure I got him back then. Yeah, <laughs> well, that was, that was my next call. It was, it was a contract sign before before you sent him to Matthew. Um, yeah. Peter, how old is the horse now? And of course, he is in the big classes, but still, even though he's an open horse and jumping in the big classes, relatively green still at that yeah. level. So there is still plenty, plenty more to come from him. Yes, he's, um, he's just turned 12. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots more. He's He's had... He has not had a lot of jumping and he is still green at that level. He's really, I think, at the end of last year, I, I realized what a horse I have with him. Um, he is just, you know, he jumps it so easily and he's confident. And, and really, I, I was looking forward to this year to really be, be his year to, to get stuck into the World Cups. Um, mm. But um, yeah. Such is life, and um, and no time penalties on him. Have we, have we cured that vice? Yeah, yeah. He's um, yeah. He, he's he's much. He's he's easier to ride, and he's um, he's he's got a bigger canter, a big step. So my my problem with him is 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 fitting in the right number of strides and the distances. But yeah, um, yeah. after yeah. lockdowns, feeling that'll be easy now. Yeah. Now, Peter, there have been the issues with the back and then there was the, the, the ankle issue. How is the body now after the second op? Um, how much uh, is there a physical uh, routine that you have to go to through with Pilates or physio to keep you going or are you, are you feeling good? I mean, how much, and I want to say this diplomatically, how much left in the tank in terms of your body is there at that level? Because it does take a toll. It does. Um, I've, I think my last stop was very good. Um, I haven't felt this strong in a long time. Um, I do try and stay fit. I go, I go to the gym a lot. Um, I try and run a bit. Um, and yeah, I try and you know, watch what I eat um, and you know, try and stay as fit as I can be. Um, and that's really a fit, fit and strong. And if I can stay fit and strong, um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great. Uh, at the moment, um, um, I don't have any back issues or pain, um, and um, I think yeah, I'm fairly fit. And um, and if I can keep it like that, I'll I'll get another couple of years, hopefully. Um, as long as I've got numerology, I'll I'll keep going. So keep going. Another, yeah, there's there, yeah. there's the reason to get up every morning. Yeah. Um, numerology is not the only Rivendell horse in the string. There is the wonderful Chancellor that Matthew rides, and then I think Cayenne as well. Yeah. Um, Matthew, tell us, tell us the story about your junior career, because you are the, uh, has there been an, are you still the current South African junior champion? No, uh, no, I, I won the junior champs in 2018. That's it, right. Bianca yeah. took your title. Um, 
Chancellor, it's been a great privilege to watch you produce that horse through the ring. You took your time with him, spent a lot of time in the smaller grades. And then as soon as he was ready, he kind of just motored through the bigger stuff and is now jumping in the big classes. You have him in the big classes, come down a little bit, put him back up. It's been wonderful to see you progress on the horse and the, and the partnership grow. Tell me about him as a horse and, and about his development and, and his temperament. He seems just very chilled, relaxed, great, great focus on the job. Yeah, he's in the ring. He, he fights for me all the time. I think he likes to win more than I do, um, especially on the last day. That's when he comes out. I put the plats in and he comes out like today he needs to show off. Um, in the beginning, my dad actually started with him. This was before um, his back off. So he started him, I think he was five when he started, um, or five and a half. So he started, he started quite late. Um, and it was very difficult. You couldn't, as soon as you cantered out in the open or went from, from in the trot, he was really good. You could trot him around. And as soon as you asked him to canter, he would just lock his jaw and run. You know, he would just go. I think our groom sat on him for the first time when he arrived in our little indoor here. Uh, doesn't have any sides. So he sort of trotted around a few times and asked him to canter and just carried on going out the indoor and into the field on the other side. Mm. So that was the start with him. Um, my dad rode him for about three months then, and he did a good job with him getting him going slowly. And um, then I took him over when my dad had his back off. Um, and then from there, going to his first show, I think he just, nothing ever phased him. He was just, his attitude towards jumping and shows was, unbelievable he's so brave and careful and um yeah so we spent a lot of time i think he went quite quickly his first show 80s or 90s second show meter third show he went to uh, i think it was rebel jumped around the 110s there at their february show and this was him going to shows from october so mm. he sort of just went along with wherever my dad went with luanda and numerology I was there with Chancellor and my horses taking them along. So you got quite a lot of show experience um, in the smaller stuff. But you, you, did spend, you did spend quite a bit of time, in, I think, in the meter 10s and before, or the meter yeah. 20s, and I then spent, suddenly spent, it exploded. I think I spent nearly a full year in the 120s with him, um, just getting the right ability right and teaching him a few turns and having a bit of a go. He won quite a few of the 120 um champs at the world cup shows um he was he's very careful um although he is brave he is he can be careful um and we sort of we got his confidence or not really his confidence he's always been a confident horse but we just took the time with him until i felt he was 100 percent ready rideable enough and knew exactly what he was doing before he went up into the 130s. And I think after I jumped my first 130, I could feel in him, he was like, okay, wait, there's, there's more to this. You know, the jumps are gonna be getting bigger. And from there, yeah, I think everything was in place. And he just, from jumping his first 130, I think it was six months or so, and he was in the 140s and jumping his first 145 at the beginning of the next year. Um, I think from his first 130 to his first 145, his worst result was four faults. Mm. Um, so there was never really any issues we had to do. He just everything we asked him, he did. Um, yep. And that's the thing. Everything was in place, and he went really quickly into the into the 150s. Mm. And how's he been going in the 150? Some of the bigger classes that you've jumped. Have there been any World Cups, uh, Grand Prix? Um, he's jumped two Grand Prix now. Um, that was last year. His first one was at Revel in August. Um, I think I had two down. That was sort of his first big 150 class. Um, he jumped his first 150 at SA Champs before then. Um, and he had a nice clear in that. And then at Maple Ridge, 
World Cup, he jumped the Grand Prix and he was double clear in that and he ended off third. Um, and then we sort of took a break, gave him a break after that for the end of the year, just to, I jumped one or two smaller classes just to get his confidence back um, or just, you know, keep the confidence in him. Um, and then he came out this year really strong. He jumped at Stocky Strike. I think that was the Stocky Strike Cup was sort of at 150. And he jumped a nice clear in that, ended off third again. And then now we've been in lockdown. So I haven't had the opportunity to jump in a World Cup. This would be, I'm turning 18 this year. So I would now be allowed to jump in the World Cups. Um, and that was something I was looking forward to with him. Um, but so you did um, you you did win the South African Junior Championships on him, and I mean that would have been a small class for you. Well, I actually I won the South African Junior Champs on Conlang in 2018. Um, ah, that's right. Conlang was first, and Chancellor was second in that class. So that was that was a good class for me. Um, yeah, that was. And Matthew, tell me um, his pedigree, and is he being used as a stallion? Because he he. There's so much to like about him. He's also the most beautiful horse. Yeah, so he's he's by Clintord, who's a stallion in America um, that sort of jumped in the 150s as well. Out of a mare called Celine Dion. She's Kalido Lunchinka. She's the same mother of Rivendell Cayenne that I've been producing as well. Um, yeah, she's quite a good foundation man. He's, he's been breeding quite a bit. Um, sort of a similar amount to numerology. I think this last season, people have realized, you know, how good he is. It mm -hmm. took him a while to get to here, but he's now, you know. And, and how, how old would be, would his eldest progeny be now? Um, Yearlings, two-year-olds? No, five. So he started. Oh, five already. Yeah. So Karen bred with him um, when he was at the stud before we got him. So okay. he has, I think he has a five-year-old and a four-year-old, just one or two, you know, that are coming in and into the competition rings now um, that are showing some good um, attributes. Um, but most of his offspring would be foals now, one-year-olds and foals. Awesome. And Matthew, a bit about you now, because um, there's a there's a new chapter in the Morrison family that's about to happen, which we're going to speak about next. But your training, um, and I think you would be the first thing, first one to say how much you owe to your parents for the amount of yeah. support and what they've invested into your in your into your career as a rider. Now, this is obviously what you want to do as going forward. You want to ride professionally, and I, I would imagine. Again, we'll get to that now that it's part of, of why the family's making the move. But um, the training that you've had and the opportunities that you've had, and the overseas experiences, all crammed into this very young man that I see before me. I mean, you're, you're, you're what now? Only 17, not even 18. 17, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you, you want to talk about my trainers that I've had? Yeah, your training, your, your career thus far and, and, um, and how much you've achieved, which is a, a huge amount. Yeah, so I started riding at a riding school just up the road from my old place in Kailami with Gene Sondra. And I used to hack up the road and go have a lesson and then, you know, hack back. Um, then we moved to our new house here in Sun Valley, um, where I started then riding with Tamar Glixman on ponies. But that was quite a short career. I never really did anything. I think I was too slow on the ponies. Um, I sort of broke the leg. Yeah. yeah, I broke my femur as well during that time. And when I sort of recovered from that, it was a quick session with the ponies and then onto horses. Um, then from Tamar, I moved to training with Lorette and Barry. Uh, I trained there for a little bit while I started to get to know Luanda and start competing. And I think Chancellor was 16. Um, then I've sort of just been training with my dad, dad when we, um, he's been great with really focused training with me, which, you know, every day black work training as well as jumping. And I've learned quite a lot. I think the most I've learned that would have been now over the last two years or three years. Um, yeah. So, with 
international experience. I think when I was in 2016 was the first time I ever went overseas to ride a little bit. That was, we went to Hillmar with Tom. Um, and that was just for two weeks for a bit of training. Um, then after that uh, was 2017 was the German friendships. That was my first show experience, let's say, overseas. Um, dealing, riding other horses by the people and, you know, in the competition ring. Um, that was a good experience. 2018, I went to China to jump in an Invitational Nations Cup, um, along with Aaron DeSantis and Haley Queen. We won that as a team, and I think I was second in the individual. So that was, that was a good experience. Um, 2019, I would say, has been or well, last year is the biggest year I've had so far. Uh, I went to Ecuador for the API adult. Um, what's a world challenge. World world jumping yeah, challenge. world jumping challenge, uh, where I finished third individually. That was that was a really nice show. Um, and then after that was another Nations Cup in China. This was a selected team, so I got my junior SA colors for Ecuador. And then now for the Nations Cup in China, I've got my young rider um, colors, and that was with Tom Trigger and Oliver Bishop. That was another good experience that we had competing under pressure on other horses in a team environment, which I really enjoyed. Um, I'd like to do more team stuff. That was for me the whole atmosphere of the show and you know, the build up to the show, working with the other riders and our chef to keep Brendan McNiven was a, it was a great experience. Um, then yeah, Chancellor and I had a great year last year. We won the 145 Grand Prix series as well as pushing into the 150s. Um, I jumped my first 150 the beginning of last year on uh, numerology when my dad was out. Um, yeah, that's been... Mm. And now, and now, COVID strikes and puts a halt on on everyone. But we're all in the yeah. we're all in the same boat. You guys, yeah, yeah. Peter, training training Matthew. You you got such a great relationship. The the, the boxing gloves never come out. Only on a Monday night yeah. when we go down the road. Yeah, that's. Uh, I send him on a Monday. I send him on a Monday for you guys to sort him out. And then he's perfect for the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I train him with my dad starts on a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and and how proud are you? I mean, it must be, yeah. give you a great great deal of satisfaction to see him come on the right way. And I've got to say, Peter, it's not only his riding. Um, it's a big credit to you as a family, you and Selma. He's, Matthew, I mean, you're sitting right there, but he's such a nice guy and, and, and polite and well-mannered and respectful as well. So he ticks, he ticks all the boxes and is well-poised for a huge career. So I'd imagine as a, as a father, you're very proud. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I am. He's, he's, he, he really works hard at, 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 and he's very diligent at whatever he does. Um, I think for most most boys to, to homeschool for a start is not easy. So he's been very good at that and dedicated at that. Um, and his riding, he's just, he's, he's very diligent. He's very dedicated. Um, and he lives it, you know, he's, he's thinking about how, Courses and how to improve it, and it's easy to teach, easy to coach, um, and it's. I think now it's a two-way street. Really, um, he probably helps me as much as I help him. Um, so you know, and there's a lot of you know communication between the two of us, and we, we discuss the horses, and um, the Selma and the rest of the family probably get tired of the two of us talking about horses or. Mm. or afternoon and evening or you know when we we come in and i come back from work and he's in the evening and we we can talk horses mm. all night yeah because so. you also both have a passion not only for the riding and the production but also for the breeding side of it i know that matthew's mm. very keen on the pedigrees yeah. and and wants to and wants to learn more so it's it's a it's a great and it's a very enviable partnership that you guys you guys have it's great to to see you working so closely let now this Thank brings you. us on to the next chapter in your lives because there is this move planned to go to Ireland. So I've got to ask, is that because of the 
situation that South Africa is politically? Is that one of the factors? Is the main driving factor uh, Matthew's future in the saddle, that Europe possibly is the place to be? Is it a combination of, of both? Where are you at in the, in, in the planning? Um, what's going to happen to the business? Tell us all about it, because you're supposed to be there now already. If COVID hadn't yeah. happened, you guys would, I assume, already be over there. Yeah, we would be. So the, the, the thinking, obviously, we've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, it's it's um, for Matthew. He wants to ride and compete in Europe. On a South African passport, it is impossible. Um, I was eligible for for an Irish passport through my grandparents, but I I never took it up. My sister did, um, and my brother and I didn't. Um, I then started exploring it about two years ago and actually did it um but it because i did it after the kids were born they don't automatically get theirs they can get their passports if they live there for three years mm -hmm. so i think yeah partly because of the political situation in in south africa i wanted to give all my kids the opportunity to to get their irish passport to have a european passport that they can travel the world and, and work wherever they wanted to do and they're not stuck in South Africa if they don't want to be here. Um, it'll open doors for Matthew from a riding point of view that he can actually stay there and ride. Um, you know, I know for, for Lexi and others that have tried, Lexi's managed to stay there probably the longest. But on a South African passport, it's very, very difficult. Um, yeah, so that's the, the biggest driving factor is, is, is my kids, really. And it's mm. not just Matthew, it's, it's all of them. Um, so Luke is going to go and study over there. He's um, he was studying law here. He's going to carry on with his law degree in, um, in a university called Maynooth. Um, he's enrolled. He's been accepted. So the the deadline was for him to be there before he was 21. So suddenly we had to to fast track this so that we could get there before he's 21, so that he could get his Irish passport through me. Um, we then with lock well, COVID and lockdown, I uh, emailed him and because he's studying and enrolled in the university and with what's happening with COVID, they'll extend that till he's 23. Okay. So that took the pressure off a little bit. Um, but yeah, we had already made plans and, and, and we are still going to go. Um, we just at this stage, not exactly sure when. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think and the, really the plan is to take the horses as well, all of them. Which ones, if not all? So it's numerology and chancellor um, to go. And then we have two young horses that are there already. Um, that, um, yeah, so the idea is that two young horses for Matthew to produce and then have chancellor to... to and produce. these are young horses you acquired over there. You didn't ship yeah. young horses out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. From here, no. Um, and where in Ireland, and are you in the thick of the, 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 the horse country in Ireland? Um, so I, the whole country is quite, is, is sort of horse country. There are obviously hotspot areas, but it's not like, like Kyle Army, where, you know, you had thousands of horses in one particular area. Mm. Um, Ireland's not very big, so you can pretty much drive anywhere within three hours around Ireland. So we looked, we looked at a few places um, and we decided on a place called in River Lodge in Wexford. Um, beautiful facilities, lovely um, outdoor arenas, big grass arena, um, a bit of a track and a um, venting course. Um, and, and we can rent some stables, so rent a portion of that. And, and we'll start small, so we'll rent, rent a, a portion of, of or some boxes for the horses that we have. There is a possibility for us to expand. We can get about 12 or so boxes there. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, trade some horses, produce horses. Um, and um, yeah, Matthew will start his career there in, in the riding and, and producing horses. And it's kind of nice because there's, there's other people who, who go to international shows from there and things. So we can tag along and, and learn the ropes a bit about yeah. going to shows 
yeah. Europe. Yeah. Matthew, you're gonna you're gonna have to seriously up your drinking game if you're gonna compete with those Irish. You you're well behind the curve. You better you better start practicing. Um, okay. Peter, what does this mean for your business? Let's talk about Martin Collins because Martin. Well, well, you tell me that Martin Collins has come to an end. You're now independent. You're yeah. not part of Martin Collins anymore. Is the business going to continue going here? Are you going to be back and forth? How's it all going to work? So. Um, round about Derby last year, um, we had a meeting with, um, with Martin Collins. He was out here and, um, they felt they, 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 they've got very corporate in the last couple of years and, and really felt that South Africa was, um, not generating the profits that they, they were expecting, um, and, and looking for, um, from my point of view, it was it was really getting expensive, and it was a big drain on the business and and, and things here. Um, and I think our climate and things are very different to what they they're doing, and they were their focus. So, what was a drain on the business? The fact that you had to pay royalties or sums yeah. over to Martin Collins to be associated with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think um, you know it, it was really it was a. a decision from them and us they're focusing a lot on the on the racing um they they're very big in australia and asia um they also have since um sold out to to a big um corporate company a french company um so they cha they changed their focus over the last 12 months um and and we didn't really fit into into that um and i yeah, i think just you know, racing in this country is um, going through tough times, mm. um, and and that is their main focus of of the of their business is is, is racing. They do some of the global champions tours and, and things like that. And obviously, still do all the arenas and things. Um, but yeah, you know, really, they didn't want to have the office here in in terms of the joint venture agreement that we we had. So it was a it, it we parted ways. Um, Amicably, um, mm. we still talk to them. There's, there's nothing, thing. You know, I still get some product from them, and, and it's just, I, I think for South Africa, um, mm. and, and the way I've, I've, I've restructured the business a little bit, um, mm. it gives us a little bit more flexibility, um, and to do some different things that, and I'm not mm. tied to specific ways that they, mm. they want things, things done. Mm. Um, well, how, how have you restructured them um, and what were the necessary changes? What is the name of the, of the company now and what do you offer? So we now, um, Peter Morrison Equestrian, um, we got away from um, really building the, the entry level arenas. We, so for the last few years, we didn't do any of that. Um, we can, can offer that now. Um, we can offer different types of fiber now. Um, we offer a, a much wider range of, of, of product. Um, there's, um, there's new technology that, that we've, we've looked at. Um, we're doing now the ebb and flow arenas. Um, we're building a, a very big one in um, uh, just outside Brits at a venue called Heartland. We've, we've done an, a, a 100 by 50 arena there or 100 by 60 arena. Um, we're busy now with an 80 by 50 ebb and flow. And um, um, we've got another small one coming in Kyle Army um, for a private client. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's quite nice. I, I'm, I've enjoyed yeah. it now. I'm, I'm my, own, my own boss again. I don't have to answer to anybody. Um, I've gained an enormous amount of experience from, from Martin Collins. Um, and I've learned. I've learned a lot um, and I think yeah I've, I've spent some time in, in Europe um, since um, the beginning of this year and end of last year um, and um, yeah I looked at, at other guys and other products and um, I think we can we can offer uh, a, a bit we've got a better offering now mm -hmm. I think than we we had before and a more flexible let's, um, option for different let's uh, I, I don't i don't want to raise anything contentious but um some people would think that the whole fiber arena surface has become slightly contentious 
There's uh, schools of thought out there that think that it has led to other to, to problems in horses, collateral um, ligament damage. There's not enough slide in the fiber. There are people talk about fiber arenas not being um, as, uh, um, how's the way to say it, not as popular as, as they were when they first came into the market. What are your sentiments, thoughts on fiber? It, um, have these arenas been pulled up and racetracks been pulled up overseas where people have dis discovered that they, that they do cause some um, ligament tendon damage? Is there any truth to these? Are these just, just myths? Uh, yeah, so in um, in America, that that's probably where most of the the the, the publicity came from from tracks and um, and tracks being so some they they call them synthetic tracks, so the synthetic tracks being being pulled out. Um, and but the reason behind that was so the the Breeders' Cup in America is is a, is, is historically a dirt race. Mm -hmm. Um, and their, their dirt racing in America, in America is very big. Um, their horses are bred to, to run on dirt. They're not um, big on turf, turf racing and, and, and turf horses. Um, so the, the, the poly track or synthetic tracks are, are replicate turf. And that, that's what they, they're there for. Um, and the reason that um, some of those tracks were taken out they were taken out and changed back to dirt tracks mm -hmm. um, was simply because those venues wanted to be able to host the Breeders' Cup. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really the, the publicity that went around that um, was some people blamed injuries and things, but the, the effect of those going back to sand, if you study the injury rates and things, um, there have been, I mean, if you look at places like Del Mar and those, there, there've been catastrophic or mm. catastrophic increase in, in injuries and things to the extent that they nearly shut down their whole racing industry. Um, mm. and, and, and it's, I think they realized they made a mistake, um, in, in changing them. Um, I do think, um, horses need to get accustomed to any, any surface. Um, I think one of the, the biggest problems, if you go, most places in 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 Europe and UK, um, all the venues are fiber. There isn't there isn't a show venue that would be sand. Um, there are still the grass rings. Um, the grass is all love to jump on grass, but it can't take the traffic. Um, so them being pulled out is it's it's not true at all. I think there's 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 more going in every every single big competition that, that I've been to around the world um, is jumped on fiber or grass. Um, there, there isn't anything that's jumped on sand. And all the top guys will be training on fiber. Um, mm -hmm. I think where we have in this country possibly more injuries is that people are not training on, on good enough surfaces. So they're competing on good surfaces, but they're not training on good enough surfaces. Mm. So for, and it's, it's, it's my opinion and I'll back it up with my own experience on, on horses and, and riding that, um, they, the people think the five arenas are hard. They're not because they, they, if you imagine this, the thickness of the surface is, is minimum of 10 centimeters a competition surface would be 12 to 15 centimeters thick um the horses work right on top of it you have the top um 20 millimeters or one inch of, of cut where there's plenty of movement in that in that top layer and it's quite a springy layer although it'll feel firm to to us walking on it um a horse weighs 600 kilos and the forces of a horse landing are two and a half times its body weight on one leg when it lands. So it needs to be a very stiff surface to, in order to, to support those. Um, and if you watch carefully and you watch the, the, the slow motion videos of horses on a fiber surface, you'll see that surface compress under the weight of the horse and actually spring back into shape. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a lot of the hoof prints, they actually pop out 
So it's not an indentation of the of the frog and things. It's a it, it pops back out. It looks like an like an inverted hoof print almost, and that's the energy return coming back out of the surface that pops it out. Um, it is quite technical, and a lot of people don't understand it. People walk across a sand arena and go, "Okay, this feels soft because they they labor across it and walk, and it feels soft to you or I." Um, but the force of the horses that sand pushes away very quickly. Um, you can't jump in a sand arena that's, that's got more than eight centimeters of sand. It's too deep. Um, but that sand pushes away once you've jumped, you jump two or three times. Um, you landing on the base, or if you're lucky, you've got maybe two or three centimeters of sand underneath. There's no cushion or elasticity in it. So that is, is jarring and, and hard. And because there's so much movement, you actually work with tendon much, much harder. Um, if you imagine a, a, a green stick that you keep bending and bending and bending, it will fray and you'll get little filaments coming off it. Um, eventually that stick will break. Um, and that's from, from overuse. Um, and I think on soft surfaces and soft um, going or deep sand, deep going, um, you, you, you're not doing the horses any favors. Um, you're making their job much harder. Um, from a training point of view, you work in muscles much harder, you work in tendons much harder, and the horses are not going to last as long. Um, so there's a very big difference between a firm surface and a hard surface. Um, and I think, you know, it's been a, obviously this was introduced, uh, I've pioneered the, the synthetic surface in, in South Africa, and it was introduced sort of 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of people, are very set in their ways and this is how we've done it for for so long um whereas europe you know they've been around for 25 years in various forms they have got better and better um i think even in the last 10 years surfaces have improved and got better and there's been a lot of research into surfaces um but the the top researchers and, and even when when we're at, at world equestrian games um, I spoke to that last week, so if he was the FEI, he's, he's actually testing surfaces at, at the big competitions. And there's, there's no thought of movement away from, from the synthetic surfaces. There is a standard that will be put out from the FEI in terms of what they should be. Um, and remember, I think a surface is also only as good as it's, its base and its drainage layers and things like that. So where we will recommend- And and and, and as good as the person maintaining it as well. A lot comes absolutely. down to, to maintaining. Yeah the, main, yeah, the maintenance of a surface and, and, and understanding and the beauty of a synthetic surface is you can, you can make it what you want. You can make it a bit softer. You can make it firmer. So you can have the same surface that you can train on at home and this, where you can make it a bit looser and a bit more open. And I think that is that that is the general consensus that the the home arenas need to be a little bit more open and, and, and things like that. Um, and then there's obviously the ratio of the fiber that you would use between a home arena and a competition arena. Um, and then a, the, the, the forces that a competition arena have to withstand of number of horses going fast turning are need to be quite a lot firmer um, and have a lot more stability. Um, so it's um, yeah, there, there's, there's a difference between the two. And then you know where we would advocate having an arena with a proper drainage system um, or a proper watering system, whether it be from underneath or or, or above. Um, your surface performs as well as you can control the moisture in that surface. Mm. So if you have a surface on a hard base with, with no drainage, um, it's not the surface's fault when it gets waterlogged. It's mm -hmm. the fact that it has no drainage. Um, and so some people, and so there's, there's you, you can have surfaces that are, um, you take a Peter Mini Arena, you can have 50 or 100 mils of rain overnight and it's perfect and good to go the next day. Um, and properly prepared and maintained, it's a great, great surface to jump on. Mm -hmm. um, by the same token, if you have a show and it doesn't get watered at all or maintained um, and it starts getting loose and deep, it's not such a great surface to jump on. 
and that is, as you say, the maintenance and things like that. So there's, you know, they, it's, it's not a case of, oh, well, you can put down a five arena and, and, and forget about it. Um, it takes less maintenance than a grass arena, it takes more punishment than a grass arena, but you still have to maintain it. You still have mm. to look after it like anything. Um, you need to service your car. It will break eventually. Um, mm. And, you know, a grass arena, a well-maintained grass arena is beautiful to jump on. A badly maintained grass arena is dangerous to jump on. Mm. Um, and that is, that is surfaces and you've got to be well, I mean, I can only speak from my experience. And as you know, we, we, we're, where I'm based, we do have the, the Martin Collins Arena. It does take a, a lot of, of maintenance, but that's a given. That's what we do. We want our horses to have good footing. I do find it better when there's a lot more moisture in it. So I'm a huge yeah. fan of it in, in summer when we have the rains. In winter, I, I do sometimes tear my hair out because we do have to water it quite a bit. But the big yeah. takeout point from what you're saying is conditioning you yeah. need to know as a competition rider that your horse is going to go to venues where nowadays 90 percent of venues are operating on fiber surfaces if you're yeah. a runner and, and you're running every day on tar and you then go and decide to do a beach run of 10ks and expect that you can run on the beach 10ks because you can run tar on 10ks the next day you are going to be so full of lactic acid and burn and stiff and sore because yep. you're not conditioned to run on the beach. The same as if you run on the beach every day and you go and then run a 10K on the beach and then think you can run a 10K on tar, you're probably going to land up with shin splints the following week because yep. you are not conditioned to be not on that surface. So 100%. what you're saying is know that you're going to go to shows jumping on fiber, go and do your road work, go and do your trotting out, trotting out on, on, on hard surfaces or find somebody who's got a fiber surface and go and jump on the fiber surface as part of your training, as part of your conditioning. I have to say, um, a vet called Johnny Cave, I sat in on a symposium that he did about 10 years ago. Same thing rings true for trainers. They train their, their, their two-year-olds up into early three-year-olds on the sand tracks, soft canters, prepping them for a race. They then decide, to, because the race is on grass, to give, give them a grass gallop. 90% of the time, the horses come back shin sore because they are not conditioned to the grass. What yeah. this study put into play is that they put horses, when they were two-year-olds, from the early, early days in the, in the training, once or twice a week, they would go and do a light canter on the grass track as part of the weekly prep, not leaving yeah. it up to before they were about to go into race. They discovered yep. that the bone density was a far, far stronger in those horses that had been conditioned that way to the horses that, uh, that didn't. So there's a lot at play here. There's a lot to go into it. And like I say, that's the takeout point. Make sure as a rider, you're doing the conditioning that you need to do. Yeah, it's exactly the same. If you're going to go and jump, jump a meter 50, your horse has got to be strong enough to jump those fences and, and fit yeah. enough to jump those fences. Um, yeah. if, if you don't train your horse properly to jump that height and, and take the time to prepare to get to that level, yeah. um, you're going to break it. Um, yeah. and, and you need to, you need to do that. Yeah. You need to yeah. do the training. Con um, condition. condition. Peter, the last point before I let you go, South African show jumping, you're the, the president of Gauteng. What exactly does that role entail? Um, and we are coming to, um, I think, uh, I think re-elections were supposed to have happened already, but nominations have happened. Then yeah. COVID happened. What's, what's happening? Are nominations going to happen again? Is that past us? Um, where, 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 where are we at? Yeah. So I think at this stage, um, all elections have been put on, on hold for now until we know what, what's happening. Um, they would, I imagine, um, I'm not, I'm not even sure if they're going to do this reset a date for the election and we go forward with those same nominations. Um, I know there was concern around and from SAF about the procedures and, and, and it's gone backwards and forwards from show jumping to SAF. Um, so we haven't got real finality in terms of what's actually happening with those elections. Um, but I'd imagine as soon as this is over and, and we move into lower levels of of lockdown or restrictions that that those elections will take place um 
you know, so I think that's going to be in a month or two, I would imagine. Right. Now, um, what we didn't talk about with your business, sorry, I got sidetracked. Mm -hmm. Once you guys have made the move, are you going to be back and forth? Is the business going to continue? Yeah. So is South Africa going to be where you earn your wage or are you taking the whole operation to Ireland? No, so South Africa will be where my business is um, and I will travel backwards and forwards. Um, our goal with, with Ireland is to, to really set up a base for, for Matt to, to start and ride out of. Um, so yeah, business-wise, I, I keep going in, in South Africa and um, I might do a little bit in Ireland in terms of, of consulting on surfaces and doing some stuff like that. But yeah, we'd really like to set up a, a nice equestrian base um, where some of the other young riders or, or people can also come to and, and, and have a and join us there and ride out of a base where we can possibly then field some teams and and maybe have a couple of horses that people could leave with us and mm. they could fly in and out and, and, and ride. Um, some of the young riders or, or older riders who ever who ever wanted to to do it. Um, one of the, the beauties of Ireland is that as a South African, you don't need a visa. So you can jump on a plane and, and go to Ireland tomorrow, which does make it easier in terms of, of short stints um, competing and getting some international experience. As well as going into Europe, you don't use up your Schengen visa time. So you can come to Ireland and train. And then let's say there's a show in anywhere in Europe then you can travel for the show and just spend mm. those days instead of training for three weeks and using up all your visa time mm. and then going to show and then having to fly home. Again. Mm. Now what happens to Matthew when he's over there in terms of his passport? Is he eligible for South African teams when the day comes or is he going to be on an Irish passport? Uh, he's being a rival for, team. No, he's eligible for South African, um, can ride on it. He'll have a, he, well, he'll get a stamp for visa, which allows him to live in Ireland, live and work and, and, and ride and what have you. Um, and would get his Irish citizenship in three years time. And then he could choose, could he have dual citizenship, he can choose. Um, but actually for the South Africans, um, it's easier to get into shows on a South African passport um, because they, you, you're not, you know, if, if you're in Ireland, you've got to be in the, the, the top top 10 in Ireland to get into any of the big shows. You start competing with the, 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 the real top riders from Ireland and there are plenty of them. Um, so the South African, it's easier to get into the shows. So the and, idea uh, would be even after the three years, he remains on his South African passport, has the well, Irish citizenship, but is eligible with the likes of uh, Oliver, Lexi, Talkies yeah. in the US, but he, he commutes between Europe as well. Um, yeah. So we're growing the amount of South African talent at the moment that's going to be based overseas, which spells a bright future for South African Nations Cups teams, Peter. And yeah. you've had experience because you've been chef to keep um, yeah. on, a, on, a, on a few occasions um, in, um, in Denmark, I think. So in, in Drummond in Norway and then Uga Holm in Denmark. And then obviously he went with Lisa to the World Equestrian Games. Um, and yeah, you know, the, we, we really have, and, um, we've got good riders. Um, we've got good horses. Um, the, the, the World Cups for us in this country have been amazing to get us to a level where we actually ride on a very similar level to what they ride in, in Europe. And I think having the World Cup shows in South Africa, in a way has given us more opportunity to jump at that level. Um, because it's difficult to get into shows in, in Europe, unless you are um, a ranked rider and, and, and have access to big strings of horses and money, it's sometimes difficult to get into to the shows that are are three star shows and four star shows and and and, the, and almost impossible into the five star shows. Um, our World Cups are pitched at a at a strong strong level, and we have our our, our riders are well mileaged at that level. So, my the biggest takeaway I got from I mean our first 
Nations Cup that we went to was was in in Norway in Drummond. Um, we all were very wet behind the ears. Arrived there, you know, as the the underdogs from South Africa, and um, and did really well. We 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 finished sixth. Um, we we beat Ireland in the in that Nations Cup. Um, and there were strong teams there. There were, there were I think, 11 or 12 starting teams. Um, so to finish six was, was a great achievement. And none of our riders were out of their depth. Um, and it, it really showed that, that we, can, we can do it. Um, we we're a little bit lucky, unlucky at, um, in Ugohal. Um We would have gone through to the, the second round. Um, but um, Oliver was clear to the last treble. Um, his horse had, had tweaked uh, uh, a ligament, and um, and and he had, I think, the, the three down or four down in the last two or four fences, um, and it was you know, just unlucky. We needed him to, even if he'd got, if, if he had one or two down, we probably would have gone through to the second round. Um, so we we can compete. We just don't have enough riders. We don't have enough depth of mm -hmm. of riders to pick a team. If, if you look at I mean, Ireland, Ireland have got 30 riders in their Nations Cup squad. Um, they have 40 horses in their, in their squad. Um, Holland, um, a huge depth of, of riders. And, and they, they can pick and field uh, two or three teams, different teams to ride at different Nations Cup. Um, their, their young riders are so strong. Um, and it's just it's the it's the depth they have, and they they can they can pick people. We've got, you know, you, you can start with six, but you can easily lose one or two. You know, a horse is sick, or a horse is sore, or a, a rider is sick, or something like that. And then suddenly you're down to, you know, you 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 picked your four, and you're down to three, and and it's 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 very difficult. And if we could get a a base, we made it easier for South Africans to 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 get there. And, and do things. I, I think we we've really got we've we've got the opportunity to to do well. And we in that little short stint that we did um, with those two two nations cup, we qualified to go to the final in Barcelona, um, which is amazing. We couldn't go because we just didn't have horses. We didn't have riders. We didn't have have enough. We couldn't put a team together. Um, so if we can have a, a strong base and, and have riders there. If a quarantine could open, then it makes it easy for for people to get horses out of here. You know, at the moment, you know, there's we we're not sure what's happening. I think it will open, um, but I think there's a bright future. And 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 really, us as South Africans, we really ride well. I think our coaching in this country is great, um, and and we 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 punch way above our our weight level. We we mm. um, we, we we can do it and, and it would be exciting to do actually. it's it's getting into the phase conversations are starting to happen yes the quarantine has to open up the audit needs to happen the a month in cape town then straight to europe would be a game changer if we could take top horses out out to europe mm -hmm. um, that also opens the the doors the opportunities for for studs like capital and kelahoe produce top horses and and Absolutely. and have another yeah. outlet for them um, yeah. What you guys are doing is so exciting. You know, if you could have a, a plan to maybe build a dormitory on one side of the house where young riders could come and visit even for a month or two, where they have a South African kind of uh, flavor around them, where things like homesickness don't play such a big part. They get think, exposed, they come back. It entices them to say, well, an overseas uh, campaign wouldn't be as lonely as it has been in the past. But the one thing that, that that is needed is is money, and not everybody is in the in, is, you know, Daddy Warbucks. Yeah. What do we do? What can South African show jumping do? What can the the for the equestrian sport horse fraternity do as a collective? Start thinking together to raise funds so that something like the World Cup doesn't become an empty chalice if you win it. You're guaranteed a spot at the World Cup finals, but boo-hoo, you're in South Africa. You can't really go. It's too expensive. You can't get your horses out. Quarantine might change. So now what changes is, well, 
where do we get the money from? How do we, how do, how does the rider who wins the World Cup series have a real shot at going over there and doing it? What are the ideas? What are some things? GoFundMe com campaigns, a cooperative between various companies um, where percentages of, of, of revenue taken through companies could be funneled into a fund. Is that something that maybe South African show jumping could, uh, could spearhead? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, um, it's, it is the only way that we're going to really give people a, a, a chance of, of going. Um, the, we've had the, the riders fund, which was a percentage of entries is 15% of all the open entries goes, goes to a fund. Um, that fund has been used and to, to bring out overseas course builders and, and improve everybody. So not only the, the top riders, but it, it, it benefits everybody that at the show. And I think it really has over the last few years, one of the reasons why our standard is so high is because of the overseas course builders and we ride at that, those courses and those levels. And I think it's got to the stage now that we need to look further than that. Um, show jumping with all the changes and, and things has, has not been in such great spaces. Um, but I think now it is, it is in a, it's in a, a, a good place, obviously put COVID and, and whatever you aside, show jumping was building up a nice fund, a nice development fund, um, riders funds, things like that. And it needs a, it needs a plan to, to now say, okay, we've got some money. How do we spend it? But it has to be sustainable. It doesn't, you can't have saying, okay, well, for this year, we're going to send the World Cup winner over with their horse, support them, um, and then the money's finished and next year there's nothing. So we need to get together as a community and go, okay, how do we make this happen? How do we actually fund it with a game plan going forward? Um, and I think we've got to look at our young riders. We've got to look at um, getting them, getting young rider teams, getting them exposure there um it's the world cups are fantastic here for developing our sport in south africa but we've got to look at how do we get teams to europe um and proper selected teams so there are the young riders some of the shows like the one that matty went to in china that's on borrowed horses but you know the young riders jump at a really strong level in they jumping at, at, at 145 150 um, the juniors are jumping at 130, 140. Um, so you need to have, you've got to have a plan and, 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 and ride in those teams. I, I, I think teams are, are something that we, we are, are, are not strong in. Um, even in our own, um, with the provincial teams, it's, they're not pitched at the right levels. I think there's, there should be, um, our provincial teams to be pitched at a, at a one meter 30 level or 135 level. Um, a lot of guys go, well, you know, I'm not going to ride my top horse in the team um, because I'm jumping the South African championships. Now I must jump the horse in the, in the 135s and, and you, you, you decline the invitation to ride in the team. Whereas in, in Europe, um, it's an honor to ride in the team. Okay, I know there's a difference between a provincial team and, and a national team, but the guys in Europe would rather ride, and they, if they're called up to ride in a Nations Cup, they will go to that show ahead of any other show. Um, that's how proud they are to ride for their, their countries. And we need to try and develop that. Um, I think it's got to start with, with teams from, from here. Um, my, my thinking around the whole thing is to change, change the teams away from, from SA Champs. So SA Champs can be the, the you focus on SA Champs for every grade and that's, that's what you want to jump in, but have a separate team event um, where you, you pick, run it on a, a Nations Cup type event um, and pick a, a South Africa A team a masters team or veteran team, a young rider team, and and some provincial teams that you you pick and, and people always say, but there's 
how teams are always going to have the strongest team. Well, you mix it up a bit that you can ride for the province that you're born in. So we try and get eight or 10 teams together of strong riders and pitch it at a one meter 40 or one meter 45 and make it a separate event. From there, you can say, okay, now you've, you've got the teams going. So you've actually picked a young rider team, okay? Um, you have a chef to keep for the young rider team. You have a chef to keep for, for the top team. And you start working together as teams in, in, the, in this country, okay? Without saying, okay, let's look at it in, in Europe. You start working and getting that team culture going in South Africa. Once we have that going, okay, then you can start to, to, to market it and actually say, right, okay, what funding do we need? And, and maybe sell it to a corporate or, or money raised out of those shows go towards funding a team. And even if it's, if you start with funds, 10% or 20% of, of what is needed, and then they can use that GoFunding and things to all, or people can look for, for funding to make things happen and, and go. And then I think it's got to start here before you, you look at it yeah. in Europe because you, you're always going to get people wanting to go to Europe and it's a big step to, to go and, and take courses. But if you, um, you're the top four ranked riders in, in, in South Africa, they're, they're, they're riders that are in, have been ranked in the top four for, for years and they don't have their South African colors. Um, and, and some of them are way more deserving of South African colors than somebody who's, who's had the money to go overseas and is being picked because they're there. Um, yeah. Not because, and, I, and that's, it is always difficult because we can't travel, but should quarantine open, it starts making it a lot more affordable. Um, and it, and it, if you've it would got be nice team, if a team selector actually had a job to do, you know? Yeah, it would be. They could select, that, not just go, well, you're, you're there, well, so. That, and that was a little, it was, was a bit of the problem, you know, with, with the, the, the Nations Cup and, and, and then the water question games, it all fell apart with, with horses getting injured and, and, and riders having to pull out. So it's, um, yeah, you know, we could, you, you can start it here and, and maybe you could have a, a, a squad there and, and you could have, even if you had, a young rider team with with Tom and Matthew that are there and are, are riding, and you could fill two spots from from here. Mm. Um, they've already been riding at that level. You understand? You can pick a team from from here. You might I pick a team of three from here and one from there. Um, so. And of course, it's all knowledge accumulated at the end of the day that we're, we're bringing back to, to South Africa. It would be a wonderful initiative if, if we could get um, teams, but we, we look like we're in a strong position now going forward to be able to do something like that, Peter. And, and, and it would be great that riders who gain that sort of experience go onto a program, get some time overseas, come back, and then in a way pay it forward to riders here, bring that knowledge back to South Africa. It's the way to progress, to move forward. Look, I think, I think it'll work both ways. You've got, got riders there that can get experience, bring it back here. And you'll have riders that are based there that you can then take and take riders from here to there, um, nurture them a bit and, and, and bring them easily into the, into the fold. So, you know, what, what Ireland and, and Holland and those guys do, they, they've got a Nations Cup team with a couple of senior riders. They're bringing in a, a 17 or 18 year old rider into that into that team and the global champions tour that's what they do you know they've got they've got their team and then they have to have a young rider coming in and i, I think you know that really if we get it going there's an opportunity for that we can we can have a bit more of a senior team there and and some young rider teams and there's there's opportunity then for for riders from here to 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 come and join and and come back and if you've got base there and you've got some things going here it can all work together and and you know you i think we really look at at, at a longer term plan and and if we start something now you'll look back in 10 years time and 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 we'll be in a very different place to where we are now um well, i think that's the way to do it we're talking about it we need um perhaps when we come out of covid um some senior guys and some young vibrant guys 
get together, have a have a conversation, get a think tank going, and and let's uh, make this happen. I cannot believe how long we've been talking. It's just about over two hours, guys. I'm going to let you go. It's Saturday evening. I thank you for your time. It's been it's been wonderful chatting, and um, yeah, hopefully we see you at the at the other side. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aiden. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers.